What is macroeconomics and how has this developed since the crash? How should we think about globalization? An especially pertinent question given the current political climate. And how important are personal relationships and interactions in determining economic performance? All discussed in episode 7 of the Irish Economics Podcast. And welcome to this episode of the Irish Economics Podcast. So today I'm joined by Professor Stephen Kinsella, who is Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Limerick. So Stephen does a lot of work assessing the performance of the Irish macro economy, uh, applying new methods to hopefully improve the way we tackle old problems. And this ranges from looking at economic forecasting and how we think about things like globalisation and policies of austerity and even how we think about households and firms interact with each other and what are known as peer effects. So hopefully you can delve deeper into these topics today and understand the implications for Irish and international economy. So maybe the first topic that might be of interest is looking at what you, your work on macroeconomic modelling and you try to look at some of the new approaches in this context and maybe for the non-economists we could start by looking at, well, what exactly is the macroeconomy. Some people might think that this is some sort of jargon. Maybe to try and break that down first and then say, well, why do we need to assess its performance? So um, first off, thank you very much for having me. This is a, it's, and I'm just, um, I'm excited to be here and, and uh, yeah, th- thanks again for doing this. Um, what is the macroeconomy? So essentially the macroeconomy is the sum of the behaviors of everyone in, in the economy. So all the households, all the firms, what the government does, and what people buy and sell from the rest of the world. And of course, what we invest. So, um, to, and what is invested in us. When we think about the macroeconomy, when I'm teaching it, I often liken it to the human body. You know, you've got the different sectors that are essentially the organs and flowing around uh, the firms, you know, the households and so forth are, is money. And money flows. So almost the first thing we teach in macroeconomics is something called a circular flow model. Um, and it, it, what this is, it's got an explicit biological metaphor behind it. It was, in fact, invented by a doctor in France um, several hundred years ago. So it's, it's very interesting that um, many of these biological metaphors uh, carry over. So the fundamental thing about macroeconomics is that my expenditure is your income and your income is my expenditure. Mm-hmm. So it's fundamentally different from the way we think about the economics of the household and it's fundamentally different from the way we think about um, how individual firms or individual sectors do their thing. Uh, it abstracts away from a lot of that, or at least in the past it used to abstract away from a lot of that. Yeah. Now it's it's really down with the data, but it's history. It's 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 um, it's at its deepest roots is a concern with counting. Uh, com- the, the, I think the first ever macroeconomic document is uh, something called Verbum Sapienti, from a guy called William Petty. So he, he this is, uh, it means words to the wise. Okay. Uh, basically, I think it's only 19 paragraphs, and you have a concern with counting people up, and you have a concern with inflation, and you have a concern with unemployment. You know, I think it's from the 1690s. I forget what the exact word, uh, date is, but it's an incredible document. In that right. all of the major concerns that you will see in 2019 are sitting in that document. Right, okay. Three, four hundred years ago. It's an extraordinary piece of uh, writing. Um, I'll send it on to you. Okay, so the traditionally, I suppose, methods would have been restricted. We would have had pen and paper or maybe simple, very simple computing power. Yeah. And would this have led, led to maybe simplifications in, in the modelling approaches? Or? You've had to, you, you, you essentially begin macroeconomics from counting up who's doing what where. Um, and even that counting process is quite partial. Uh, the technology that existed in the 30s and 40s when they really started thinking carefully about what everyone does in the macroeconomy yeah. was really, really limited. Um, it was limited pretty much to the UK and the US and, uh, when it first started. And there were actually a number of approaches um, uh, to counting out what people did. There was something called input-output analysis. There's something uh, called the national accounts um, 
real sectoral accounts and then flows of funds accounts and money flows. These are all totally different approaches. Um, uh, there was a thing in the 50s called activity analysis, right. which has totally fallen by the wayside. The history of macroeconomics macro is really the history of people trying to figure out what the best abstraction is. Right, okay. Um, and, and that was true really up until about 10 years ago. Um, so it, as, as much as 10 years ago, it was completely fine to write down a macro model that had, that you essentially assumed that there was one person in it. So this is something called a representative agent model. Okay. And that one person was sort of multiplied infinitely. And there were different preferences, whatever. And then yeah. they, what they did was they, this, this single individual, this, this cloned individual did their best to maximize their income or minimize their work or maximize their leisure or whatever it was the problem was right. subject to a, an intertemporal constraint. So the, the, the problem, the problem you always had was the economy was a bit like a rocket shooting yeah. off. But it was the mathematics that we use to describe it, or it is literally rocket science. Right. Okay. It is literally rocket science <laughs> that, that 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 is used to describe um, how these things take off and and and, uh, and land. And um, they're really, it's really nice mathematics okay. actually. Um, but uh, it turns out to have been an, abst- an abstraction too far. Right. In the key sense that. Um, it's an abstraction too far in the key sense that it got us away from something that's really fundamental uh, in the study of the economy, which is the balance sheet. Right. OK, so this is this is where we come on to maybe the, the stocks and flows of, 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 of money in the economy. Exactly. So I, I started um, looking at what's called stock flow consistent macroeconomics in 2006. I had just arrived back from um, New York where I did my PhD and uh, I was told, you're teaching monetary economics. And I said, okay, (laughs) what do I do? (laughs) You know, what do I do here? And um, luckily I I rang my my PhD advisor and I said, what should I do? He said, well, there's this book I've just been sent to review. It's called Monetary Economics. Right. I think it's probably, you know, right down your alley. And I said, okay, cool. Send it over to me. So he sent it, this book over by these two guys, um, Wynne Godley and Marc Lavoie. Okay. And uh, this book was not unlike anything I'd ever read in macroeconomics in that it starts off from the data. Okay. It just goes, here's the data. And then it says, well, we're pretty sure people aren't rational. We're pretty sure there are different there are different ways to think about rationality, but we're we're going to assume that people basically do what they do, and we don't we're not able to see inside them. Yeah, yeah. right. So unlike the representative agent model, which assumes that you know somebody at a, at a psychological level. Yeah. Right. This says, well, we don't really know anybody, um, but we can count what they do. Right. So we should probably just look at the data first. So this starts from. That counting exercise, right? Okay. That Petty did, and that you know, in 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 the, in the 16th century, and then people people were trying to do, you know, up, up until the 1950s and 60s, and then sort of expanded, and then it just says, well, look, everything that comes from somewhere has to go somewhere. Right. If I buy you a cup of coffee, I get the coffee, and the guy who sells me the coffee gets some money. Yeah. The, the money has flown out of my account into that into the coffee seller's account, and I have got a cup of coffee. Yeah, right. And it's sort of it's it, it sounds really stupid, right? But at 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 the but it's a really really simple and kind of fundamental thing. Yeah. And then you you can ask yourself questions about well, okay, where does it go? Can you trace the flow? And there there are there are data sets for doing that. Yeah. Um, and so what I started doing was writing teaching notes about this new way of doing macroeconomics okay. just for my students. And I taught myself the approach just by having the need to teach them something that wasn't everything is perfect yeah. and everybody's maximizing everything. And, you know, there's no such thing as a crisis because, of course, 
when I started teaching this, it was 2007. And yeah. yes, indeed, there was a crisis. So coming back and saying, you know, well, the economy is moving pretty well. And all the text, the previous textbooks were saying things like, well, you know, the economy is doing well. There's been this great moderation. Yeah. All of that's nonsense now, right? Yeah. So I wasn't able to teach any of that stuff with a, with a straight face. Sure. Whereas this yeah. stuff is saying it's absolutely fine to get a balance sheet that's just out of whack. Yeah. You know, of course, a firm can become insolvent. So the stock loan thing has been going really well. Um, so we've got a number of grants. Um, I think we have about 2 million in grants for various postdocs. So lots of people have now done their PhDs and stuff right. in this. Um, and uh, some, lots of software has been written. And what was very interesting was I had a group of, I think, I think it was six postdocs here at one stage in Limerick. And they were doing all these different types of models. Right. So if you admit a plurality of modeling approaches, well, you shouldn't be surprised when lots of different approaches come up. So we ended up doing things that were strict stock flow models. So basically the way you do a stock flow model, unlike uh, unlike a traditional macro model where you get some... You get some data on capital, you get some data on labor, you get some data on output. Mm -hmm. You try to fit them together and see how they they go over time. With this, you take very, very large balance sheet, national balance sheet data sets. Uh, For example, we did one for the Bank of England and working with uh, three colleagues from the Bank of England over a couple of years. Um, And one day, like we printed out the flow of funds of the United Kingdom. Right. And so we're in a room that's like, I don't know three meters by three meters it was about eight meters long like we just printed it off it went across about six tables right, okay. it's a huge data set right um and what was fascinating about the experience of working with policymakers was they were kind of saying like this has to be right you know yeah and you're kind of going yeah yeah no it does it has to be right and and that imposing that discipline on the, the real world discipline on us was amazing. It was a really interesting experience. And then, so the sort of methods you'd have to employ would be a lot more complicated to yeah. take into account all these different that's right. complexities. So, that's right. So so one of the big problems with these models, right, which is still totally unsolved, is uh, you, in order to, to you, you can't write down one or two equations. Yeah. Uh, I think you're, you're talking about 60 or 70 equations, right? Yeah. And each of them has like at least one parameter. Yeah. Right. So um, in, in t- like in modeling terms, you're always asking yourself, what's the value of that parameter? Yeah. And what you find really interestingly, actually, is if you go beyond, I think a lot of our training as economists is very much in the household sector. Yeah. So if I ask you right now, like, what do you think is the, uh, the marginal propensity to consume out of current income? Right, you're right. In Ireland, like you've got, like, if you ask yourself that question for a for a for a second, yeah, you go, ah, it has to be like not point eight, not point nine. In other words, like I give you, I give you an extra ten euros, yeah. you're probably gonna spend, spend most of it, most of it <laughs> right? Which is fine. It's completely grand. Now, if I ask, what is the marginal propensity of a a financial firm in the uh, OFI sector, other financials? Right, so there's a shadow bank or something. Yeah. What's its marginal propensity to save? You have no intuition of that. Yeah. Right, like, whereas with the household sector, you totally have an intuition because it's closer to what your training is. You've seen some econometric data. Yeah. Nobody's done that stuff, right? Yeah. So there's that. The time series data is pretty limited. Like you're talking, it's quarterly data, it's super noisy. Mm. The best countries in the world, like we got a grant to do one for the Irish economy, totally couldn't do one. Right. Like, we just couldn't just do it. Just didn't have the data. We literally didn't have the data. Um, uh, we, we're like, I just have to wait around another 10 years and yeah. then I'll do the data. <laughs> right. Then I'll do it. It'll be fine. Uh, but at the time, um, in 2011, when got the grant, we just had so, 11 years of data. So you had loads of people taking different approaches. And was it a case of, well, we have to find what's the way to go here. And we don't really know what we were going, but exactly. we want to go down different avenues and see yeah. which one is most successful yeah so we did this sort of let many flowers bloom thing which was really inefficient from a research perspective but was really efficient from an ideas perspective so in terms of research outputs like we got two or three a year uh if we just gone everyone will do this one thing we would have had 20 right right so so in terms of the production possibilities frontier of research you know um 
uh, we were putting out five, six journal articles a year, which for six people is pretty small, yeah, right? Yeah. That's not, I mean, that's not a great return on investment. Um, but in terms of the ideas, it was incredibly interesting. Incredibly interesting. So some of the guys realized that because we have this data that's basically at the sectoral level, you know, it's like households and firms, yeah. we've kind of nothing underpinning why those households do those things. So a really nice aspect of the other macroeconomics that I was telling you about before is that they actually have a really, really good story about why people are doing things, yeah. like individuals. The problem is every, all those individuals are highly homogenous and they can't do things like default on loans. Okay. Or at least they couldn't. So I'll come on to that in a minute. Right. But in 2006, 2007, they couldn't. So, um, yeah, so we, we, one of the lads started saying, well, look, we clearly need an agent-based model. Yeah. We need to be able to specify the agents in the system at a very, very granular level. And I was saying, yeah, okay, that, so computationally, how difficult is that? And they said, well, we will need a supercomputer. Yeah, it's, you, it's verging on data science. How have you got one? And I said, well, I don't have one, Yeah, but I could get us some money and we could build one. So we built these servers right. out of something called, um, what are they called? They're called, uh, they're called G, uh, graphic, it's, uh, they're graphical engines. So we, it, the graphics card of a computer is the fastest part of it, typically. Right. And so we wrote the software in order to maximize this graphics card thing. Right, okay. So we had to build these kind of server things which was a really exciting and slightly terrifying day because i'd spent you know a good quarter of the grant on these little black box yokes yeah and if they didn't work we were screwed so we put these things together um and they work great so we, we were we built this piece of software uh which is free freely available now it's a platform um and it's called jmap and basically um it's an agent-based modeler that has a stock flow consistent component on top of it. Right. So we insi- we impose the discipline of everything must go somewhere, right? Okay. We have to map the stocks to the flows, no problem. But then we also impose a further discipline, which is that everyone's flows somewhere within the system yeah. go somewhere. So there, you're, you're once you've got that modeling set up there, you're able to do bank runs. You're able to talk about what happens when firms go out of business. You're able to talk about what happens when some of the agents in the system are a bit crazier than the others you know and they're really into investing and all this kind of stuff yeah so cool really really cool took like two days to run run these things but they were great and the graphics that came out of them were just sweet yeah some really good publications so so some of them so the graphical capability really impressed me so we got papers published in the journal of economic dynamics and control with people like joe stiglitz he was very interested in this approach um, uh, and the accounting organizations and society, places like that, um, Cambridge Journal of Economics. So, we, like, it was it was getting well published. It was really good. Um, and then, so I got quite interested in the mathematical connections between the graphs that we were producing, right, and these the mathematical elements of the stock flow consistent approach. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so I did a PhD in NY Galway. Before, That's the time. <laughs> before I went to New York, about um, these mathematical approaches, right? Okay. Um, and uh, so, shout out to NUI anyway, Galway uh, <laughs> for for um, putting up with both of us for that. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but what's really exciting? What was really exciting about that was I was able to take some of the mathematical training that I'd done in Galway, right? Okay, and apply it here. So what what we did was, and this got published in the Journal of Computational Economics. Yeah, was uh, we proved that there's a strict correspondence between every stock flow consistent model and what's called a directed acyclic graph. Right. Okay. Which and so you're able to show that because the money goes from one place to another, the verb to mm-hmm. is exactly corresponding um, to the what's called a vertex. So it literally moves in that direction. Yeah. So it's super cool and great fun. So great these, fun. So these models then. Were they, you said you're using uh, bank, like English data. Yeah. Was this calibrated to English data or was it at this stage just a sort of a toy model that was? Oh yeah. So, so um, great question. So some of them are toy models where you basically like knock up some data and then just like 
run some econometrics. Oh, that's another problem with this data, with these models, by the way. The econometrics, econometrics are super, super simple. Right, okay. Right, because in order to re- maintain stock flow consistency, you know, I spend 100, you take in 100. Hmm. What that actually requires is that everything has to stay in nominal terms. So you can't, like, first difference anything. Okay. You can't take the log of something. So you have to get, you, you, you know, you're, you're, you're working on these super, super complicated models, right? Yeah. Incredibly complicated models, 60, 70, 80 equations. And then you, you're putting it through the simplest kind of econometrics you can get your hands on. And so w- reviewers have quite rightly said, lads, <laughs> come on, <laughs> you know, you're not, yeah. <laughs> you're not, uh, you're not really at the races here with this. And they're completely right. The problem is, um, the problem is Godley and Lavoie wrote these models. They didn't write them in order to have an econometric specification. Yeah. Right. So empirical stock flow consistent modeling is really still, there's still less than uh, 10 of these done. So I've done one for Italy. I've done one for um, Australia, which just came out. Um, the it completely unoriginally, uh, Matilda, we call it the Matilda model. Okay. Yeah. I mean, God, you know, but anyway, we, uh, <laughs> it was an Australian, by the way, who, who came up with that idea. Okay. Um, but yeah. Um, and so, th- so these models are interesting. But uh, I, I have to say that what they taught me was that y- you have to respect these, these things in a system. Yeah. But they also probably taught me that you can only really go so far with these models before you come up against the necessary problem of having to make a reliable forecast with them. Yeah, and then the, the tools... I, and I then, the the tools then the tools just fall apart. Yeah. Um, so... There is an agent-based approach to this stuff. There is an econometric approach to this stuff. There is a kind of a mathematical, Bayesian-directed, acyclic graph approach to this stuff. And each time we did one, and I must have written 20 of them at this point, like, um, and everybody from that group has gone on to do one for their own economy. So there's one for Denmark, for example, a former PhD student. Right. Another, another uh, guy who went straight from a postdoc to an associate professorship. Okay, from nice. here um he uh he's done a few for like Colombia places like that you know so they're they're starting to find their way into policy related discussions yeah but for me as an academic the the modeling framework hasn't evolved at sufficient speed uh okay. they're still like Mathematically speaking, that they're not, they're still not dynamically stable, for example. Okay. Right. Um, I mean, this may be a little bit too in the weeds for the podcast, but there, there, there is a serious problem with, um, with pricing. So yeah. you can't, you, you, prices have to be relatively stable or in a stable corridor to yeah. get this stuff to work. So it's like, I'm really, I'm really interested in the literature, but I feel like at least for the moment, and I'd be refereeing papers on this kind mm. of all the time. I can't see yet the major methodological innovation because it's a me- it's not a it's not a question of the theory. The theory is fine. Yeah, it's not a question of the econometrics because we can't get the data to cohere with the econometrics. Right. Yeah. It's a question of what is the methodological innovation that brings us closer to a really nice solution like that makes a really nice coherent model that has some predictive ability um and And, yeah but and so you were saying that um sometimes so basically it seems these are very novel methods and when you write up your paper you send it on and then reviewers look at it and say well this isn't what i'm used to looking at and that can there can be some pushback there Mm -hmm. Do you feel like it, it, it can be difficult to get things out there? In, in that oh, it's sense? definitely difficult. I mean, there's a lot of these papers that are just sitting as working papers, right? Yeah. But what I think, uh, and while my, my, my co-authors are apt to get a bit down about this, they, you know, you, you, you see, oh, the mainstream are against us. They're not really. They're curious, yeah. right? If we were writing what's called a dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model, yeah. which they've all seen before. 
There's a format to writing these papers. You just knock them up and then you go, here's my little twist. And people go, oh, that's grand. Or that's not grand. And they move on. With, with ours, we have to go, there's this thing, right? <laughs> it's really complicated, guys. Here's 10 pages on this. So you kind of have to sweat through it. And so it becomes a very interesting communication challenge. Yeah. And I, I, I'm somebody, really I think about communicating economics a lot. So I've been um, for a different sort of part of my work. And I've, and I've, I've really kind of just obsessed about how to teach these models and how to really get them over yeah. to people's idea uh, in, into people's minds um one of the things i i have thought about doing in the past was doing like an online course you know to show people what this looks like so if you're going if you're going to youtube like what is stuff low consistent economics like you get these just you know kindly sit through my two-hour lecture where like where i bloviate at a whiteboard like that's not what people want you know yeah. they want very short eight minutes here's an example here's some literature here you go yeah. um there's just there are only so many hours in the day but yeah. you have to do that communication bit right so it's not that there's this you know closed mindedness out there they're just people who are very busy sure you know and they've got 16 papers to review like i think i've got eight to review right now like and they're just going, oh, come on. You know, yeah. And you just have to get over that hurdle. And that's yeah. a communication challenge as much as anything else. Yeah, um, yeah which is interesting. So another thing then that that uh, came to mind was, so you were talking about these sort of new methods applied to macroeconomic modeling and the stock flow, consist- stock flow consistency is one aspect of that. But then I know in this rebuilding macro project that you're working on, it seems to be bringing in a lot of different disciplines like anthropologists and yeah. When people think about economics, they don't think about these sort of people getting involved. They don't. So how do they, how, how does that fit into this whole modeling framework? Is it that we have this ensemble of different uh, uh, viewpoints? Or do you say, well, this is what they say. We, we plug this in as a parameter into our model. Or would it be a bit of both? Maybe? Uh, it's a bit of both. So uh, what Rebuilding Macro is in f- six hubs. And the hub that I lead is called Can Globalization Benefit All? Mm. I was very struck in... 2016, uh, at how shocked everyone was by Trump and Brexit and all of that. But I had also had a really profound experience in Ireland, having lived through this austerity period. Um, We are sitting in the Kemi Business School uh, in the University of Limerick, um, which had its own austerity, right? Right. So I I once had a situation um, where... You know, you'd go to the, uh, you'd go to get some stationery, you know, yeah. and uh, the, somebody would take an eraser and cut it in half and give it to you. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. So we lived through this period. We all, you know, we all had our pay cut, yeah. all this kind of stuff. So it's an interesting problem in that um, if you live, having lived through these crises, mm. I, I, I'm aware that some people are made better off by globalization. And some people are made worse off. I mean, we are Irish, right? Um, we are we are definitely the winners yeah. from this. Um, but we do impose losses on others. Right? Mm. And you're not going to... It's a substantial threat, in my view, and this is moving into international political economy rather than macroeconomics, which is a, you know, a different thing. But it, it just struck me, having done a lot of reading about it, that unless we were able to include into our macro models the fact that um, the family matters, mm-hmm. right, we weren't going to be able to explain certain effects. For example, um, when a large factory leaves um, uh, a town in Vietnam, mm. its effects are totally different to the same firm leaving a town in India. Right. And the reason is, Family structures, right? Okay. The family structures, and this is very well published, Journal of International Economics, 2014 work um, by uh, colleagues from Dartmouth. And what they found was just this familial ties were stronger and the social welfare networks were local. Okay. So you were only able to claim the dole in your own area and your family structure was very important to you in India. Whereas in Vietnam, the people had just dispersed and went off and did their thing. Not that family isn't important in Vietnam, it's just not as strong. Right. It's not a controlling variable. So as a macroeconomist, that tells you family matters. Yeah. Well, how do you model 
a family in a macro model. It's really, really hard, right? Yeah. Or uh, take, the, take the experience of debt. We know colleagues at the Central Bank in Ireland have shown us that, uh, and, and they've shown it econometrically, that the experience of excessive indebtedness. So mm-hmm. you, so it's not that you, you just owe some money. Like you just you owe way more than you'll ever be able to pay back. It actually damages consumption for decades into the future. Now, there's no macroeconomic reason why that's true, right? Yeah, yeah. It, that that there, there's a thing in most macro models is called the transversality condition, and basically you go past this, and then you're so, you're so indebted it doesn't matter. You go back to what you were doing before, and it's like, well, no, that. That does matter. So the idea of the globalization benefiting all part is to take some of the stuff that we learned from the INET projects, like there's an agent-based stock flow model in that project. Mm. There's also stuff about the new economics of belonging from a geographer and an anthropologist. Like, what does it mean to belong? Yeah, right. no, so, I was just reading yeah. that. That was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so there's six different approaches, and each of them has to say, like, in order to get the money, they had to show, like, why is this relevant? So, for example, we've got one on global value chains. Yeah. Why are global value chains important? Um, the construction of social identity uh, in Switzerland mm. is about we follow the rules, right? right? Okay. And if you think about the construction of social identity in Ireland, it's something to the effect of, like, we were oppressed, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, uh, and so, so, and we are not now... Uh, unless you're like, I don't know, the Irish rugby team or something. Um, they weren't depressed. They were just beaten. Yeah. But no, the, 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 main, the main thing there is um, when, you, when you think about it carefully, you go, okay, so Swiss people think that we follow the rules. Swiss multinationals in their supply chains do not follow the rules. So globalization is value chains. It is just the fact that the iPhone is assembled in China so when, and what, sold everywhere so else. So when they don't follow the rules, what, what, what does that mean? Swiss social activists get together right. and coalesce and they say, you are Swiss. You are not like us. Okay. You must change. And the Swiss companies go, yeah, no, that's fair enough. We should change. Right. right. So you've got a giant multinational company, okay. you know, bigger than the GDP of Ireland, altering its behavior. And that alters globalization. Right. Okay. And does that benefit all or not? Okay. That's so an open question. So that, that uh, changes their behavior down throughout the different yes. supply chains and where they're operating in different countries, yes. and therefore that affects the households in these countries. And yes. Okay. Right. So from a that's from a geographer's perspective, right? Sure. But then from an anthropological perspective, you go to a place uh, in the south of England mm. where they've seen vast industrializations, and they say, well, you know. You know, a macroeconomist was like, well, it's grand. We'll increase taxes on the on the rich people. We'll send you some money. That yeah. would be great. And what they've shown is like, no, no, no. There are the, this, this idea of, of being in a depressed region, yeah. it's far greater than we... It's far greater than any monetary transfer can compensate us for, yeah. even if there were a monetary transfer, which, by the way, there is not. Yeah. Right? There's a brilliant book by a guy called Mike, Michael Trebelko, and it's called Dealing with the Losers. Right. And this book completely changed my mind. Okay. Like, I would have been a pretty standard, you know, well, just so tax the rich know. lads, send some money to the poor lads, job done. No. So, 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 so people who are in these depressed regions, they have, like, there would always be a social argument for some sort of transfer to, to help people who are, who are in bad conditions. But maybe now there's an economic reason because it, it feeds back into your perspective, into, into your how, how you perform at work, things yeah. like that. And, yeah, yeah. and one thing that comes to mind then alongside that is you th- see things like maybe areas of Detroit where, you know, it's depressed now after motor industry left. And this leads to sort of inequality and political activism. And this has, uh, you know, feedback loops in- into, the, into the economy and that wouldn't be accounted for traditionally. Exactly. And this is why when we want to think about Globalization, we have to use a political economy lens, right? We have to talk about ideas and interests and institutions. So again, this comes back a bit like the stock flow macro stuff to teaching. So I'm teaching a course called International Political Economy (laughs) in the concert hall in about, I don't know, half an hour and at 28 minutes. And um, one of the things that I talk about all the time is uh, these the interaction of ideas interests and institutions 
it's really hard to get those into a macro model. Yeah. Because many macro models abstract away from institutional boundaries. Now that's starting to happen as well in macro. So do you remember, the, do you remember I was telling you that uh, uh, the kind of standard mainstream macro models weren't able to cope with, you know, bank runs and banking collapses and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, they are now. You know, like it's not fair to say that these models aren't evolving. They are, and at a prodigious rate, actually. Yeah. And um, so it's it's not uncommon now to re- open a, an episode, uh, open an, uh, uh, an issue of the uh, Journal of Monetary Economics, which is the main macro journal in the world, and see you know a DSGE model where you've got loads and loads of banks going under. Yeah. So the science is moving forward, right? Um, slowly and imperfectly, and whatever, and not as fast as you might like, but it is moving forward. I think that as economics moves to become a more empirical science, the people who have the data and the people who have the, the ability to really, really work with that data, um, they're the people who will generate the most value. Um, and so I've been working on a series of projects with the Central Statistics Office and the Department of Business here about labor market flows. Right. So because we're, it's just really clear, we're, we're becoming an empirical science where where the modeling, if you take the modeling to its most extreme, and I've, I've gone pretty far, I'm not saying I'm the most extreme at all, but I've gone pretty far down those lines. I've spent a number of years thinking carefully about this stuff. Yeah. You, come across, you come across the problem that ultimately, when it really comes down to it, you're not dealing with real data. Yeah. That's, that's the problem. And uh, You can have all the methodological innovation you want. You can, have, you can be as fancy econometrically as you like, you're not dealing with real data. You're dealing with aggregated, estimated, interpolated data. Yeah. yeah. So, like, what do you do? Well, you go looking for where there's a big, broad data set of all the things. Nice. Um, and so I went looking for that. And uh, uh, I gave up because I couldn't find it. And then <laughs> I was at an INET conference. Very good. And it came to me. So uh, this um, postdoc met me and um, uh, an extremely brilliant person yeah really brilliant person uh, her name is uh, Neve O'Cleary and she uh, was a postdoc at Harvard and uh, then moved to Oxford and is now moving to UCL as a professor right very good uh, skipping all steps in between because she's awesome right she's a network scientist she's a mathematician but she does network stuff and she was saying well look I have this idea for this network model and I know somebody in the CSO could we give this a bit of a lash? And I was like, yes, yes, we can. Yeah, okay. So we have this paper looking at labor flows right. in the Irish economy. So you leave Potsdam, or no, let's say you leave Trinity and you come to UL. Yeah. Right. Or you leave UL and you go to Dell. Yeah. 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 That's one flow out. Right. And then it, and if I leave Dell and I come to UL, that's flow in. Yeah. So we have the net labor flow. Right. Okay. So it, it, yeah. yeah, at the sectoral level, okay. but we have it for the entire economy. Okay. Good. Literally the whole thing. So this is macroeconomics, right? Like it goes back to Petty in it, Petty's Verbum Sapienti. Mm. Yeah. So it's literally counting up all the stuff. It's the entire Irish economy. Yeah. There's no macro model there. There's no stock flow. Anything. I mean, there's a. There, it is interesting that the stock flow idea comes in because yeah. obviously it's stock flow inconsistent. Because yeah. you've got all these workers and they're leaving the country. Yes. So we've got an estimate of how many workers are leaving the country and how many workers are losing their jobs. You right, know? okay. But anyway, uh, long story short, we're able to use these network models to build a picture of the Irish economy. Okay. And so, you're, sector. so you're, you're applying these, you're bringing in mathematical techniques yeah. and a lot of, so it's very much interdisciplinary yeah, type yeah, yeah. of approach. It's all, uh, my, my approach to economics is to ask a question, yeah. ask, why is that thing like that? Yeah. And then try really hard to come up with an answer. And it takes you over these really weird terrains, right? You find yourself sitting in a room talking about Swiss activists, do you know? Right, okay. And you find yourself in rooms talking about the nature of shadow banking and uh, in rooms talking about the legal issues around data sharing. Yeah. And knocking up supercomputer stuff 
and just spending a lot of your time kind of going like, why, why am I doing any of this? You know, like it's, it's, it's a really exciting way to do economics. It's just really scattershot. Yeah, but it's all over the shop. If you have this open you know? approach and you take into all these ideas, eventually you hit on something that works. That, yeah. That helps. Yeah, so. yeah, I mean, look, look, look. It's it's, it's worked in the sense that, um, in the sense that uh, I and the people who work with me are quite happy to come to work every day, mm. and it's worked in the sense that the uh, you know the journals like it. It's worked in the sense that you know there are central banks and policy places using these models. Yeah. Um, and it's worked in the sense that there are still government departments who are interested in this stuff. Mm-hmm. To the extent that it gets published in the American Inco- Economic Review with the Journal of Monetary Economics, is, is, is to my mind, it's not even a secondary question. Yeah. I'm far more interested in just having a lash. Like, I'm really excited to do this labour flow stuff because we have one of the big questions in Ireland, which is a political economy question, is what is the role of the multinational yeah. in Ireland in an era of de-globalisation? Right. In order to answer that question, you have to know a lot about the multinationals in Ireland, yeah. and like, and to do that using a network approach with labor flow data is a really, really, really interesting question. I have no idea what the answer is. One thing I just wanted to mention was you have you have an interesting paper on um, agent based modeling looking at uh, crop adoption. I mean, oh you're, yeah, you're talking about. Um, you're talking about families and the importance of families. And one, mm. I think one of the results there was that basically if you're, if you're in a developing country, if you're, if you're trying to in, encourage the adoption of these new technologies and people with good, strong family connections tend to, it tends to prolif- proliferate a lot, a lot quicker. So this would, the policy implication to me there is that, well, if we're going to seed these new uh, technologies, we want to start with people who have good families. Would that, would that be? Yeah. So, so this was, um, this was a, a paper with uh, my former PhD student, who's now a full professor in China, Hang Zhang, mm-hmm. and with the late uh, and, and uh, dearly missed um, Professor Diane Payne from UCD. Um, she just passed away this year, um, very sadly. And uh, so the idea of this paper was uh, Hang went to China, to where he's from, and he was talking about the adoption of two different crops. And he was just looking at it. And it was not rational to do, like no rational crop producer would produce either of these crops um, because of the weather and because of the uncertainty associated with the price and the quantity and so on and so forth. Um, what he showed was that familial structure was the determining variable. So if I was your uncle and I had these seeds, I would be far more likely to give the seeds to you than to someone else, yeah. regardless of whatever price you paid. Yeah. Right. And what, what, what was interesting about this was we were able to replicate that behavior, which he studied experimentally. So he went out and talked to them and listened to them and surveyed them and so forth. So we got real on the ground data, what we're now calling thick data. We used to be call it, we used to call it talking to people, but yeah, now it's okay. thick data. Right. I don't know, whatever. I mean, it's, it's the term it's in the, new phrase to me. it's the term in the literature. You have to use thick data. So, all right, you heard it here, folks, on the Irish Economics Podcast, thick data. So, yeah, it's thick data. So he just would, went talking to people. And then the paper allowed two things. The first was, the re- was, was uh, and I think this is chapter three of his thesis, mm. maybe chapter four. Um, he, the paper shows that experimentally uh, and, and, and in an agent-based way, yeah. you were able to show the propagation of the crops using the familial networks. Yes. You know, so it's a really, really nice paper. And Hang, is, uh, Hang is, is an extraordinary social scientist in that he's somebody who combines really, really deep technical expertise. I mean, you know, he was sort of at the computer all day, every day for yeah. months trying to get this thing to work with the ability to go and survey a giant area of rural China. Wow. No bother. You know, and it's those two skill sets are quite, or at least in the past have been in, in, in independent of one another, or at least they haven't been as dependent on one another as you might like. But it was, it was proper economics, like really good economics. He went and had, had the app to people that informed what he was doing. Then he had the, then he, he had the model, yeah. built the model, and then he showed the model back to the people. And they were like, yeah, no, that seems like it. That's how it went. Right, so yeah. he, so he was able to kind of find something out about the structure 
of the society in which he lived mm. that I don't think he'd be able to find using a traditional macro model or even like a network based model right, right. Um, even though that model that he builds actually does have some network components in it um, because I was just really interested to see what, what would happen okay. but uh, yeah I mean he, one of the other great privileges <clears throat> of doing this stuff is just working with people who are yeah. they're just excellent I mean they're just really really excellent people one day I was chatting to him and I was like, what's wrong with you? And he goes, oh, I was just up all night. Like, the lad was nearly dead. He was underneath the, 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 the table in bits because he'd been up coding all night. Yeah. And I remember doing that myself, my PhD. And I just thought, isn't it wonderful to be around people? I didn't ask him to do this. Like, yeah, of course, he did it. it himself. He just flaked off and did it himself. And it's just, it's just really exciting to do that. Kind yeah, well, kind of obviously work. passionate about what he does. Yeah. Okay, I, I don't want to hold you up any more no longer. Uh, Stephen, thanks a million. That oh, was it's a really my pleasure. interesting chat. And yeah, I really enjoyed it, actually. No, my, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you very much for, for um, uh, listening to me and putting up with me. And uh, I wish you every success, success with the uh, podcast going forward. I think it's a brilliant idea. Okay, thanks, Stephen. All the best. So there are two, maybe three more episodes left in this first series. And I really want to get as many listeners on board as possible over the next couple of weeks. So if you have a friend with an interest in some of the topics discussed, colleagues, if you're at school or college, please, please mention the podcast whenever you get a chance. If you're on social media, a tweet on Twitter or a tag on Instagram always leads to new listeners. So please, if you've enjoyed any of the, any of the episodes so far, let the world know by tagging at Irish Econ Pod on Twitter, Instagram or Facebook and help me with giving the podcast a big social media push this week. That would be really appreciated. Uh, So thank you, everybody, and look forward to talking to you next week.